Well, good morning to you all. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm battling whatever this uh, polony allergy season brings us with upper respiratory stuff. I've got it this morning, so um, I haven't been smoking cigarettes this morning, if you're wondering. Uh, if you have Bibles, we're going to be in Hebrews today for a good bit, which as I've reflected on this, always grateful to Richard to invite me. I always surprised people will come to listen and always grateful to have a place to, to talk. Um, so Richard's kind enough to do this. R- Richard asked me last month, this is no, no quiz here, uh, no pop quiz, but last, last month I, I spoke on the penitential psalms. Mr. Al and I were talking about that this morning. Something related to the season of Lent, you know, these psalms that sort of enter into the space of our existence where we recognize in sort of palpable ways our sin, and, and these psalms give us a pattern for how we go about confessing um, to the Lord and what the nature of guilt is and the beauty and the glory of God's forgiveness and the way in which that liberates us and frees us to love the Lord and then to love our neighbor. Um, so that was a Lenten thing, and then he's asked me this, this month to speak on something related to Easter. <clears throat> now, it's a li- little early for that, right? We're still, for you liturgical uh, people out there, we're still in the season of Lent, technically, and next week we go through Holy Week to get to Easter Sunday. So there, there are certain important stops we have to make along the way, and all of those stops are are really important. I, I, um, I remember earlier, uh, maybe earlier this year, last Sunday of Epiphany at our church where some of us in here attend, um, I preached a sermon on, on, the, on the transfiguration. I'm still, frankly, taken with that whole narrative. It's a remarkable scene where we get to see, as one theologian said, Jesus just as he really is. I mean, when he when he begins to radiate forth the glory of God in his own body so that his clothes become so white, I love what Mark's gospel says, so that no, uh, ble- no bleach in the whole world could make that, his clothes as white as those are. I laugh about that because in our, in our home we've got baseball players, and so my wife has discovered this, uh, I don't know what it is, wonder bleach, that you stick white baseball pants in this stuff and soak it overnight and Lo and behold, they look, you know, there, there goes that clay. I don't, I don't know how it happens. But, I mean, Mark would say, hey, that's pretty impressive. Not close to what, you know, they experience on the top of the Mount of Transfiguration. And surrounding all of that, where you have these episodes in the Gospels, where Jesus makes it very clear that he's not just the earthly king returned. Um, he's not just a messianic figure, kind of like, um, the best Josiah that we could ever hope for, or the best King David that we could ever hope for, Jesus is demonstrating left and right through the Gospels that he is the God of Israel in their midst. That, that's the most offensive part about what Jesus says and does. And the Pharisees get it, right? When he says, your sins are forgiven you to that woman, right in front of all the Pharisees. Um, they grumbled among themselves, remember? Like, well, only God can forgive sins. And when Jesus looks at a little girl and says, Talitha kum, little girl arise, and she comes from death to life, I mean, only God has the power over life. Only God can take that which is dead and make it alive again. In fact, that's, that's God's character in the Old Testament is to take things that are dead, like, Egypt, like Israel and Egypt, and to make them alive again. And, the, and then he's on the boat in the Sea of Galilee, and he tells the winds and the waves to calm down, and it's as if they recognize his voice, they know who he is. Um, it's, you know, so we see that Jesus is, is embodying in both the things that he says and in the actions that he does, that he is the God of Israel in their midst. And yet, follow kind of Mark's gospel all the way through, Jesus will tell them after he does these incredible things, it's, it's, I've always found it bizarre, don't tell anybody what just happened. Right. And of course they always blow it, like they can't help it. Uh, you keep this between us. Remember, remember the, guy, the blind man that was healed, right, the blind man, and you know, don't tell anybody this, and he's telling everybody, and ends up before the Pharisees, and they start accusing him of you know, why, what happened. And, and this beautiful, simple blind man 
um, looks at the Pharisees who can now see, and he says, well, I don't, know what, I don't know what to tell you who he is. All I know is yesterday I couldn't see, and today I can. That's a great answer. So G- Jesus is embodying this, and then he's telling his disciples not to tell anybody. And I think at least part of the reason <clears throat> why Jesus is telling them this is because he needs them to understand that he has to go through the route of humiliation before the exaltation. I mean, they, they were so excited. I mean, this is obviously the, all the promises of the, of the Davidic kingdom that we have in the Old Testament. They're going to come to fruition right now. And the, the, the kingdom is, is on us. And that's all the language that Jesus is using. And they're operating with what we would think would be a kind of an assumed understanding of what that kingdom was going to look like. And Jesus tells them, I have to die first before um, I uh, go through um, the resurrection, before I go through the exaltation. And they did not understand this. You could, you go read Mark's gospel. It's kind of fun. They talk among themselves. What is he talking about, this whole death thing? So um, Jesus has to go through death before he gets to resurrection. And, and we will too, by the way. Right? That's, that's, for those of you that are in traditions that follow the Holy Week dynamic, we have to go through those um, linear temporal movements as well with Monday, Thursday, Jesus washing feet, and then Good Friday where we force ourselves to go again to the cross and we hear um, the whole of the, of the uh, crucifixion story read for us in Isaiah and John. And then we move into the tension of Holy Saturday, like here we're caught between the hope of Easter Sunday and the, and the horror of Good Friday. By the way, just as an aside, I think much of our Christian existence right now kind of operates within that space of Holy Saturday. We, we, that, that's kind of where we are in, in perpetuity. We live between the realities of Good Friday and the hope of the resurrection of the dead. We're, we're living in that even now, only then to move to Easter Sunday, which is the great you know, unleashing of, the, of joy and celebration. It's why... Um, it's so rich uh, to come together on Easter Sunday and to sing our hearts out, right? Or that place is like the Advent. That's when you bring the brass. Like, you know, let's, bring, let's, let's bring in the brass to play some trumpets and stuff and some timpanies in church um, because we're, we're unleashed in praise. This is the triumph of it all. But you got to go through the cross um, to get to the resurrection. So we, we know that. So I'm, I'm a little early in what I'm about to talk about today. So this is, this is something for you to think about as you move into Easter and then the season of Easter a- after that, after uh, next Sunday. And, and here's the question that I'm raising for us this morning. The question is, when Jesus raises from the dead and then eventually ascends to the Father, sitting as he does at the right hand of the Father, what is Jesus doing right now? Um, it's troubling, frankly, that Jesus had to leave us. Uh, the disciples in John's Gospel, for example, are very troubled that Jesus has to leave. You remember he starts in John 14, the so-called farewell discourse. And Jesus says, I'm going to back to the Father. I'm going to prepare places for you. I'm building for you. I'm going to be away from you. I'm going to send my spirit back to you. And they're all like, what is he talking about? Like, What, what do you mean you have to leave? Um, we, we live with the reality of Jesus' absence and his presence. We know he's not here like we would want him to be, and yet he's also present in ways that he's promised us by the Spirit, especially when we gather together for worship. So the question is, what does Jesus do? What, what's his activity? What's his divine life within um, the life of God himself now, with his humanity raised before the Father uh, in communion with the Holy Spirit. What, what is Jesus doing now? I should tell you all, um, the topic that we're talking about this morning, and I don't want to overstate this, but I, but I think I'm, I'm being as sincere as I know how to be, has been for me um, one of the most spiritually edifying and encouraging facets of my faith over the last 20 years. Um, and it began to sort of creep in about 20 years ago, thinking about being in a seminary, frankly, and thinking a little bit about what does it mean, why is the Trinity important? I know I, I, know I need to confess it to be true, but what, what, what's, what are the implications of God's triune life? And 
This is the basic theme that we're going to look at this morning and think about a little bit out loud. Jesus, as our raised and our ascended Lord, whose humanity is in the very life of God himself, um, ever lives right now to intercede and to pray for us. Right now, Jesus, before the Father and by the Holy Spirit, is praying and interceding for you, for those you love, for your church, for the world. He's praying for his people. Now, that to me has been one of the more encouraging and hopeful gospel messages that I know is that Jesus, in the language of John Calvin, does not sit idly in heaven. Jesus is active in heaven. And his activity <coughs> has to do primarily with his intercessory role for me and for you. He's praying for us. So, with that said, and we're, we're going to come at this from lots of angles this morning, uh, aware of the time, okay? Um, but with that said, uh, he, the book of Hebrews is the place where this particular facet of Jesus' ministry and life, even now, is really highlighted. Um, how many of you have done, just out of curiosity, uh, Bible studies on the book of, of Hebrews? Any of you done a Bible study before in Hebrews? Um, have you, <coughs> uh, Hebrews is a um, fascinating book, controversial in many ways, uh, still, still not overly sure who wrote the book of Hebrews. Um, Richard asked me yesterday kind of in a naughty way. He's like, so, you know, who, who do you think wrote Hebrews? And, and I said, I don't really know. If, I, if, if we get to heaven and I meet the Apostle Paul and he says, hey, by the way, I wrote that thing, I, I think my response is going to be, I thought so. Um, but, you know, we just, you know, we're not, we're not for sure uh, who wrote the book. But the book is a rich sermon. That, that's worth knowing. It, it, it presents itself as a sermon. Um, that it's not a bad Holy Week exercise for you uh, to think about maybe reading the whole book of Hebrews in one sitting. Just sit down and start at chapter 1, go all the way through chapter 13. I don't think it'll take you all that long, you know, maybe 20 minutes at the most, I think, 20, 25 minutes. Um, it's a rich and full book presented as a sermon. And, and, and many scholars, I, I'm somewhat persuaded by this, but many scholars understand the book of Hebrews, to have as its intended audience a second generation of Christians. And this is a generation of Christians who are wavering in their faith. Now, they're about to face persecution. Um, and unlike the first generation where you normally find the real initial energy and heat of the faith, right, um, that's why, like, church plants, you know, like, boy, the early days of a church plant are so exciting. And then, then church plants, with all their early energy, go from their infant phase and their toddler phase into their teenage years with some acne developing. And, you know, now we've got to figure out how to organize this thing. And then you become, an, you know, you, you know how these things go. I, I was involved in a church plant or on staff at a church um, years ago in my early 20s in Greenville, South Carolina, uh, and by the time I was on the staff, the church had grown to about 12, 1,300 people. I was a youth director in the church of about 100 kids. And there were still founding members of that church that remember with such fondness the bringing the lawn chairs, you know, into the small storefront, you know, to, to have church together like that. There was just a sweetness about that early season of life together as a church, of, of life together in their faith. But, you know, time rolls on. You know, generations you know, try to pass on the faithful, but there's no guarantee that one generation will necessarily lead to a faithful generation that comes subsequently to them. You see this, for example, um, in the history of American, uh, North American Christianity with the Great Awakenings, right? You have these Great Awakenings that are occurring in the, in the, the mid-18th century. So think Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield and the Wesley Brothers and incredible conversions and mass, masses of people that are turning to Jesus and loving his word and being empowered by the spirit. And now, you know, like some of those cities like Northampton, Massachusetts are some of the most sort of progressive and morally corrupt places in, the, in, in, the, in North America and have been for a long time. So 
There's no guarantee, right, that future generations will carry on in a faithful way. And the author to Hebrews is writing to a group of, of, of uh, Christians who are in that sort of wavering phase. It could go either way. I mean, they're about to face persecution. And, they're in, and, and what he does in this sermon, and it's a powerful sermon. It's some, some of it's hard. I think Hebrews 6 and parts of Hebrews 10 are some of the more challenging chapters in all the Bible. I mean, so there's some hard things in here. But what he's doing is painting this incredible painting with the broad brush strokes of who Jesus is in all of his glory and all of his superiority. And it begins, for example, in chapter 1, telling you that Jesus is better than the angels. I mean, angels are amazing, but Jesus is infinitely better than angels. And Moses, what, what an incredible figure in paradigm Moses is, but Jesus is so much bigger and so much better than, than Moses is. Um, and he's emphasizing for them that Jesus is their high priest. He is the one who's interceding for them. He knows their character and their frame. He knows their weakness. He knows their susceptibility to temptation. He's aware of all of those dynamics. And he, even now, as the ascended and the exalted Lord, the risen God-man who intercedes for us, is now praying for them in accord with who they are in their brokenness and their fallenness. That's what the author of the Hebrews wants them to know. Jesus is praying for you, and he's for you. Now, to get to, here, here's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at the, the first few verses of Hebrews. Then we're going to look at a little bit of Hebrews 4 and a little bit of Hebrews 7, and then I'll land the plane. Is that, is that all right? We'll, we'll see. My, my kids are always, uh, um, when, they, when they're forced to hear me teach, they love, they, love, they love the plane landing metaphor. Like, you know, get, get that thing down. Let's, don't, don't circle the tarmac too much. Let's get this thing down. And I'm reading from the NIV this morning. In the past... God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. So that, that verse, right out of the gate, he's making this comparing and contrasting of the past and the present. In, in the old economy, which is still a vibrant economy, the scriptures of Israel, God spoke through the prophets in all kinds of different ways. And you know that, right? I mean, Ezekiel, um, go lie on your side for 365 days. Uh, Hosea, go, um, go marry a woman that's going to become unfaithful to you so that you can demonstrate in your own family life the infidelity of Israel to me. Go do that, Hosea. Um, Ezekiel, don't, your, your wife is going to die today. You're not allowed to mourn her death. I'm, 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 uh, Jeremiah, this is one of my favorite ones with my students. Jeremiah, go, uh, um, go, go get some silk undergarments, like some silk underwear. Uh, fresh and clean, then go bury that underwear in the ground, go back in a few days and dig it up and tell me what you see. Well, you see spoiled underwear. And he's like, well, so, so are my people. You know, I mean, so all kinds of wild ways in which the prophets would communicate God's word to the people, so various and sundry ways. But then he goes on to say, but in these last days, we're in the last days. We're in the days of the resurrection of the dead. Jesus is no longer in a tomb. He's alive. In these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed. And li listen to th this description of Jesus is about as good as it gets. All right? L listen to this, these, these, uh, these descriptive terms. Whom He appointed heir of all things. I'm going to read it, and then we'll, we'll explain it. Heir of all things. And through whom also he made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. He sustains everything by the power of his own word. And after he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. And he has become so much more superior to the angels as the name that he has inherited is superior to theirs. So who, who is this Jesus, the Son, who he's spoken through in these latter days? He's the heir of all things. So th think about how grandiose a statement that is. If it exists in the material or the immaterial world, 
if it's a star in a far galaxy, if it's a trout that's swimming right now in some stream we all wish we were on, you know, out west or in the Carolina mountains, I mean, from the gr most grandiose to the most minute to the visible and the invisible, he is the Lord of it all. It's all his because he made it all. He's the very instrument, Hebrews tells us, by which God brought the world into being. Now, um, th this is kind of fun. I I've never seen this before. I was in conversation with my, uh, with, uh, my doctoral supervisor, who is still in communication with me. He thinks I still need help, which I kind of appreciate that. Um, and uh, we were talking about um, can we get a little geeky just for a second? Hang with me, I know it's early. Um, the first word of the Hebrew Bible, right out of the gate, is in the beginning. One word in Hebrew, Bereshit. And the scribes of the Hebrew Bible have put a disjunctive accent there. So, so it, it goes something like this. In the beginning, semicolon. Or in the beginning, big long line. Or in the beginning, period. And then it goes, God created the heavens and the earth. So it sets beginning off from the God creating the heavens and the earth. When you get into John's gospel, Jesus says some things in John's gospel that blow our hair back. Like, try this one on for size. Before Abraham was, remember this? I am. I mean, and they all get it. Like he's using the language of the burning bush. I am who I am. And Jesus is saying, that's me. I and mean, that's remarkable. In John uh, verse eight, uh, chapter 8, verse 26, I wasn't going to have you do this, but look at this real fast with me if you have a Bible. In John chapter 8. Again, I have the NIV here. Verse, not, not 26, verse 25. The crowd looks at Jesus and they say, who are you? Isn't that a great question? And this is what the NIV says. And Jesus said to them, just what I have been telling you from the beginning. I think that's kind of what most translations do. <clears throat> I tell my students to be some all the time, don't, don't get into pulpits or classroom settings in the church and say the Greek says and the Hebrew says. I mean, just teach well. And, um, so don't tell them what I'm about to do. The Greek says, I mean, I hate to say that. Um, something rather startling. They asked Jesus, who are you? And in the Greek it says, and Jesus replied, the beginning. Not that which I've told you from the beginning. Jesus says, in effect, I am the beginning one. It's a title that he's taken on himself. And the church, the best of the churchly tradition of interpretation has read that in conjunction with Genesis 1-1, because when you read in the beginning, you can just as easily and rightly, grammatically read that by the beginning one. He created the heavens and the earth. Not just in the beginning temporally, but by the agency of the beginning one, God created the heavens and the earth. And here Jesus is saying, I am the beginning one. How does John begin? John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning, by the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So Jesus, and, and I think the author to the Hebrews would say, yes, that's right, right? He is the very instrument. He's the means. He is God's word. God said, let there be light. Next line, boom, there was light. So he's the very instrument by which God brought the whole world into the being. And he's also the self-same uh, instrument that preserves and holds the world together. Atoms aren't flying apart, um, you know, uh, because his word holds them together. The Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic Ocean are not swallowing up Florida because his word keeps them at bay. The flood narrative in Genesis says all it takes is for God to withdraw that uh, powerful presence and here comes the floodwaters again. So that's the picture here of who Jesus is. He's the creator of the world. He's the sustainer of the world. So he's the creator and he's also our redeemer. 
And, that, and he's linking these things together here. And when he had made purification for sins, he sat down. So what's the language here? Now we're moving into this priestly language. The one who knows the stars and has named the stars and they all obey him and listen to his voice and shine for his glory. That selfsame Jesus, who is the instrument for the, why the world is, is also our high priest who has entered into the heavenly holy of holies with his own blood in his hands. So the, you, you, you know enough about the old Leviticus and, oh, I don't know, Leviticus is a weird book. I mean, people commit to reading the Bible like, like Genesis, that was fun. Exodus was great until we got to the weird stuff at the back. And uh, then Leviticus, I'm, like, ah, I'm out, I'll go back to the Psalms. Right? I mean, Leviticus is a strange uh, bowl of soup. But you know enough about Leviticus that it's really concerned about blood. Blood matters because blood is where life is to be found. And life is under the whole sovereign care of God himself. God is the Lord of life. He's the Lord of blood. It's one of the reasons why God didn't want his people eating uh, blood, right? That, that's God's area of, of life. So the priest would go in once a year on Yom Kippur, would go into the Holy of Holies with that blood, uh, taking blood with him to spread at the corners of the mercy seat there at the Ark of the Covenant. In effect, and this is a very pedestrian way of putting this, but in effect, to be a kind of spiritual Ajax for the temple and the people, right? Sin had built up this sort of residue throughout the year. And you go in with blood and the offering of the blood, and the blood cleanses all that temple area and makes worship possible again. And then what does the priest do? The priest then backs out. There was no chair for the priest in the Holy of Holies. In fact, I have to imagine um, that, you know, if you were the high priest, you would have had very mixed feelings about going into the Holy of Holies once a year. Because there's, there's no guarantee that you come out alive. Are you going into the presence of God? I mean, if you know anything about the unmediated presence of God in the Old Testament, it's rarely a happy occasion for anybody. I mean, so here goes in the priest, and he offers it, and then he backs out, knowing that the moment he backs out, that cleanliness of the temple is about to become marred again as the residue of sin begins to build on day one, as we wait for Yom Kippur the next year. And it seems like the author to the Hebrews is playing with that tradition here. He's saying, listen, Jesus, as our high priest, does a few things that no high priest has ever done. Number one, he is both, Jesus, our high priest and the victim slain. He's both things at the same time. Our high priest and he's our victim slain. Um, I'm, I'm just a curiosity. Most of you here have been in, in the chapel at Beeson, where, where I teach for a living, the, the big dome there. Yeah. Apparently, from what I think I've heard, it's the largest dome in the state of Alabama. Have all these saints up there in the you know, 16, the students I think call them the sweet 16 you know, that are up there. You know, I always encourage my students when, when they feel like they're struggling, I say, don't worry, none of us, me included, we're never making the dome. So you're, we're okay, we're okay. Um, but what you have up there as well is Jesus with his hands outstretched. And the story goes, I've heard it from Timothy George many times, the story is that the Romanian artist, once he had finished, called Dr. George, the, the founding dean of the school, said, I want you to see the work, it's done. So he came in and Timothy looked up and he saw and, and he said, it looks great, one thing needs to be fixed. And the artist was kind of taken back, you know, well, what, what is it? He says, well... Jesus' outstretched hands have no scars in them. So you're going you're gonna to have to go up there and put some scars in. If you go in, you'll see his hands are stretched out and there are scars in his hands. Um, apparently from the Doubting Thomas scene, I've got to put my hands in, your, in the scars. Jesus in his resurrected body still has the imprint of, on that body of his atoning work. So think about that. Jesus' resurrected body in the very life of God himself right now interceding for us, has the scars of his atoning work embedded in his body as a perpetual witness to his sacrifice on our behalf. That's remarkable, right? And by the way, that's the only way you and I get into heaven. That is it. If someone asks you um, the great Presbyterian evangelism explosion question, Ricky, Ricky will know this question, um, 
If God were to ask you today, why should I let you in my heaven? Have you ever heard that question before, Ricky? Uh, if I, he's going to ask you today, what would you say? Uh, here's a decent answer to that question if you believe it by faith. Jesus. That's it. I mean, I, I, I get to come in because my high priest, my risen Lord has lived life for me and he's died death for me and he's raised to new life for me and he bears in his bodies a perpetual reminder of his atoning work and I'm only in because of what he's done for me. I get in in no other way. So that's remarkable. It's a beautiful claim about Jesus here. He, he is both priest and victim at the same time. And then number two, it says something remarkable here. After he had made atonement, what does he do? He sits down. No priest ever sat down. Jesus sits down because his, his atoning work is now once and for all. We use that language. You Anglican, the Episcopalian types here will know the language of that liturgy with some regularity. He offered himself once for all upon the cross. And his once for allness on the cross, which we're about to enter into next week, has trans-historical and eternal implications. It's one of the reasons why the Apostle Paul could say he's the lamb that was slain from before the foundations of the world. Like, well, what does that even mean? Well, we're entering into the mysteries of the universe. Okay, so that's how he presents it right out of the gate. Jesus, our ascended Lord, he's our high priest, the creator, and the redeemer. Okay, let's go to Hebrews 4, shall we? No, I didn't let's yakking too long today. Why don't you see these few verses and then we'll, we'll end the plane. Chapter 4, verse 14. And let, and let this be an encouragement to you, brothers. Oh, I pray it will be. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, remember, he's encouraging wavering Christians, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. All right, hold your finger there and then go to Hebrews chapter 7. Verse 23, now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he's able to save completely those who come to God through him. And I want you to just let these words wash over you. They have been such an encouragement to me. Because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest truly meets our need. Holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priest, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day. First for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. Um, the, the language that the book of Hebrews uses when it talks about Jesus and his humanity and his perpetual priesthood is fittingness. He is a fitting high priest for you and for me. Well, what does that mean? That means that he entered into the world of humanity. In, in a phrase in, in Hebrews 5 that's really worth unpacking, we just don't have time, it says he learned obedience in the school of human suffering. So, so Jesus enters into the world, God, the Son, the eternally begotten Son of God, enters into the world and takes on human flesh, Philippians chapter 2, and enters into the limitations of our humanity, knowing what it is to hunger, knowing what it is to grieve, Remember him standing before the tomb of Lazarus, knowing because he's God that Lazarus is about to come forth, but he sees 
Mary and Martha and the townspeople in grief over the loss of Lazarus. And what does it say? Jesus wept, wept over sorrow with what was going on around him. Um, It says in Hebrews that he even knows what temptation is as he goes out into the wilderness and the devil tempts him with the powers of the world. And he knows temptation. And yet, unlike you and me, unlike ancient Israel, he doesn't give in to it. He's sinless. He's But he knows the temptation. So he's a fitting high priest for us that knows our weaknesses. He knows our infirmities. He understands the limitations that come with being, in the language of Psalm 103, just dust. He knows your frame. God took some dust and spit into it and formed Adam and Eve. So he knows that you're just dust. He knows your frame. And he ever lives to intercede for you. He's praying for you. His very presence is the promise of intercession for you. They're mine, Lord, right? Um, That one there, he's mine. I lived life for him. I died death for him. Even in his frailty, even in his uh, temptation, even in his broken sinfulness and yielding to temptation again, he's mine. I'm interceding uh, for him. Uh, Can I just give you a few, I don't know, thoughts um, before I let you go this morning, of why this has been so encouraging, at least to me. A um, c- couple things. N- number one, um, this has helped me understand prayer a little bit. Pr- prayer is mystery. Uh, have you ever met anybody who's really satisfied with their prayer life? <laughs> like, yeah, I've got that thing under control. And, um, I, mean, I think it's, you know, here, here's what I found encouraging. The fact that Jesus is our high priest and he prays for us, he intercedes for us. And in the language of Romans 8 with the Spirit, he intercedes for us in accord with God's will because only God knows God's will. I think what this means is in Hebrews 4, we come boldly before the throne of grace. You come confidently and you pray as your heart and your mind drive you to pray with the confidence to say things to God that might even be risky, the whole book of Psalms, but to speak to God confidently and honestly and transparently about your fallenness and your sinfulness and your hopes and your dreams and your cares and concerns for those that you love and for those that are in your family and for your church and for the needs of the world. You pray about those things. And here's where Some good old-fashioned Trinitarian theology of prayer can help us with this. When we come boldly, we say whatever we want to say by the movement of our own hearts and minds to God. And here's some good news for us. Jesus takes your prayers and, this isn't very sophisticated, cleans them up and presents those prayers to the Father as your intercessor by the Spirit, in accord with God's will and intent and purposes. He cleans up your prayers for you. He prays for you. Um, Joel, so, someone told me this recently. Joel Brooks, who's the pastor of Redeemer Community Church in town here, a really wonderful parish. Um, I, I, apparently, Joel recently, in some setting, told people, I look back on the prayers that I used to pray for my younger children, and I'm so grateful that God did not answer them the way in which I thought he should have. Um, I'm saying prayers right now for my children, um, as we all do, you know, wondering like, well, Lord, I'm praying this, but I know, Jesus, that you're interceding to the Father by the Spirit on their behalf in accord with your purposes and intent. This, This requires faith. It requires a certain kind of faith and trust that God knows better and He knows best. Even when that entails hardness and challenges, He knows better and He sees more clearly and His divine intent is more um, purposeful and it's more truthful than whatever it is we can imagine. So think about, think about the, um, the implications of this. God knows us. Jesus knows your children. Jesus knows um, your wife. Jesus knows that those that you love better and more fully and more deeply than we could ever know them. 
and he's, and he's praying for them. So I find that to be very encouraging. Se- a second thing. I also find it to be encouraging because um, people are intimidated to pray, especially in a public setting. Uh, not, maybe not anyone in this room, um, but I've experienced it a lot where you've been, you're in local church settings and, and people are like, don't call on me to pray. Like, I don't, I don't like to do that. Um, and I think part of that is maybe just introversion. I mean, I get that. But another part of it is um, I've heard those people who really know how to pray. Um, that person that sounds a little bit like a Shakespearean sonnet every time they pray. Like, oh, my goodness, they really, I mean, or, or they're a, a person that's deep in their faith. Um, I don't want to take away from that, that we grow in prayer, we grow in a depth of communion with the Lord. I'm not in any way challenging that. But I want you to know that when we're talking about our prayers in accordance with the will of God, can I use a basketball analogy that's really probably corny and not great, but here it is, right? We just finished watching Sanford play last night. Um, They have that young man, and I'm embarrassed. Sanford pays my mortgage, right? But that's the first basketball game I've watched of them all year, last night on TV. Shame on me. Um, but this young man who was from Australia, I mean, they taught, did you see him do a, he did a slam dunk from about the middle of the key and just went up in the air and his arm is like above the rim like that. I mean, the guy's got to jump out of the gym. So if he and I had a jumping contest, Jen Ledden, this, this power forward for Sanford had a jumping contest, I think my vertical leap is probably at this age, I'm 48, a solid three inches. Like, I think I could get my whole body about three inches off the ground, and then it would quickly tumble back. Um, and let's say his is 42 to 48, or whatever it is. I mean, jumps out of the gym. He, he obviously can jump better than I can. But if someone were to come to the two of us and say, that's impressive, you can really jump, and you're, you know, you are who you are. Um, now, I would like for you to jump and touch the moon. Go, go ahead, jump and touch the moon. Well, all of a sudden, the differences in our vertical jump becomes, become relative real fast. Um, I, I say that to encourage, like, in other words, we pray. Um, and whether or not you're deep in your faith, or whether or not your faith in the language of Isaiah 42 is a flickering flame or a bruised reed, you pray, you offer your prayers, even your doubts to the Lord, knowing that Jesus is interceding for you. And then thirdly, this is my final thing, thirdly, and I, I would say, I, I, I find myself even this week, in light of this talk that we've had, um, saying <coughs> out loud, Jesus, would you pray for my son? Jesus, would you, would you pray for so-and-so? Um, when you're at that place where it, you're spiritually dry, and your, your prayers feel like words that are bount, bouncing off of a brass ceiling, or you've entered into that space that the medieval mystics would call the dark night of the soul, and you're despondent and you're discouraged and hard for you to articulate words of prayer at all, or you are grieving, or you are scared, or you don't know what's around the corner. How often I've found myself in those situations simply uttering those words, Jesus, please pray for this situation. Jesus, I can't, I'm I'm so nervous about the outcome of this doctor's report. Would you please pray for me in this? Would you please pray in accord with God's will in this situation for this outcome, for this circumstance, for this um, reality in my life? Because... The gospel hope of Jesus as our high priest is that he ever lives to intercede for us, and he's praying for you even now. He knows your name. He knows who you are. He's claimed you as his own. He knows your infirmities and your weaknesses, and he knows you better than you know yourself. And he's praying to the Father by the Spirit with your name on his lips. Lord Jesus, bless us as we go. Thank you for these men, for those that are on Zoom. Um, Jesus, pray for all of us. We know that you are. Even when we don't know it, you are. Um, let, that, let that give us gospel hope, O oh Lord, that you know your own and you will not lose one of us. And for those that we love and we're concerned about, O oh Lord, um, pray for them too. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.